Welcome, welcome everybody back to 113. Let's go ahead and switch over to the notes page. Cut off good old Kevin MacLeod again. Uh, that music, yeah, it, it's all Kevin MacLeod because his stuff is um, free. Um, I forget what the name of the licensing is that uh, he uses, but when I upload it to YouTube, it doesn't get um, flagged and then taken down. So I use a lot of his music. As you would probably notice, a lot of people on YouTube actually use his music. Um, the more you listen to it, the more you hear it elsewhere. So our um, topic for today, actually give me a, a quick yes, no in the chat as long as you can um, hear me. Uh, I know you can see me because I can see the, the video up there, but just to make sure everybody can hear me. Okay, cool. Looks like pretty much everybody can hear me. Um, topic for uh, today, uh, two things. So we have our usual uh, fika in the, the middle of class, um, but we also have a, a different topic in the sense that we're, we're now looking at um, special applications of the CSTR. So up until now, we've been looking at sort of the general case for a CSTR. Um, there are a couple of special cases that pop up often enough that it's, it's worth um, looking at uh, while they're here. Uh, actually, why don't we just share that screen one more time. Um, over here, this is the, the things that uh, we're interested in. So what you're seeing here is called a fluidized bed reactor. Uh, it's actually two different takes on a fluidized bed reactor. So the image on the left um, reactor, and you see sort of a bed of particles sitting on the bottom, and then a fluid of one form or another, either a, a liquid or a gas, uh, comes in through the um, bottom of the reactor, and it actually lifts up those particles. So those particles are up and spinning around and moving around and, and moving throughout that whole volume of the reactor. Um, sometimes there's a, a small screen up on the top that actually stops the particles from going out, um, but otherwise, the uh, in other cases, the reactors are designed in such a way where the only portion of the bed where the, the particles can actually fluidize and lift up is towards the bottom, right? So if you make it kind of conical like this, um, you can get the, the particles to uh, fluidize down on the, the bottom where the gas velocities are very high or the liquid velocities are very high. Uh, and then if it, as it goes up and eventually comes out straight like that, the gas velocities slow down. And so they don't impart quite as much lift on those particles. Um, and so they, they naturally fall back down to their level. The image that's on the right, the one that keeps zooming in further and further and further, that's very slow. Um, it's just to remind you what those particles are actually doing inside of the reactor, which is sort of a constant state of, of agitation. Um, but they are kind of going in a, a loop, right? The, the loop might not be quite as neat as what you're seeing there, where they're falling down the outside and rising up through the center. But yeah, more or less like that. Um, and so the, the key point with that um, video is that what you're actually seeing is flow in a gas. Um, and so this is the first time that we'll be able to look at um, gas phase flows. Everything that we've done up until now, with the exception of some of the um, equilibrium reactors that we were looking at, uh, everything with the CSTRs has been liquid phase. Um, but today we're gonna introduce the concepts to analyze a gas phase CSTR. Um, and a gas phase CSTR usually looks like what you're seeing here, which is a fluidized bed reactor. Um, it, it's usually not the case where it's just a bucket with a stirrer in it and it's stirring around. That's, that's not really a gas phase CSTR, but effectively the, the design equations are the same. Um, we just have to worry about now uh, an extra term being for gas phases um, instead of liquid phases. So let's stop sharing that and we'll switch back over to our uh, notes so that we can work with these. Uh, go ahead and close that, keep chat as best I can. And let's get started. So um, gas phase reactions, almost everything that we've dealt with up until now does not need to change for a, a gas phase um, reaction. On the other hand, the one part that does change, its, its effects can be felt in a lot of different places, um, which is like kind of fortunate and unfortunate, right? It's only one thing that has to change, uh, but we'll have to keep track of its uh, changes in more than one place, but that's how it goes. So gas phase reactions. Oh, just a couple of reminders too. The homework is due soon and the um, project, first part of the project is due soon. Um, I think the project is due later in the week. Um, homework three will be posted later today, but it's only gonna have, I, I think I settled on three problems. Um, it'll, it'll be due in about a week, um, but I figure you'll have some work to do on the project. So we'll, we'll try and keep homework three kind of short. 
um, gas phase reactions. Um, and specifically, these gas phase reactions are going to be in um, CSTRs. So a CSTR in the gas phase, or a CSTR operated with gases, is for the most part equivalent to what we call a fluidized bed reactor. Fluidized bed reactor. And that is referring to the image that we just saw a moment ago where we have a bunch of particles um, inside of a bed. Uh, they're you know, being agitated around somehow. Uh, let's see if I can sketch this. They often look like this sort of like inverted cone design. Um, and so the flow will come in through the bottom uh, and typically come out through the top, although that is by no means required, uh, but that is a very common design. So it might come in through here. Uh, and then the particles that are sitting um, inside of here are usually kept at um, a particular height. The height being set by either a, a screen, like a mechanical screen that sits on top of there, or they're kept at that height by careful control of the gas velocity um, and the size of the particles, right? So a, a smaller particle will have generally less drag on it because its surface area is smaller. So the volume that we have here uh, is still considered constant. Um, and that's the same critical uh, assumption that we had with um, the liquid phase CSTRs was that the volume was constant. However, there's usually no mixer in here um, and that the actual volume fluctuates a little bit, right? Because the top layer of those particles kind of move around a little bit, but to a pretty good first approximation, the, the, the volume is, is constant. Um, and so the, the gas still manages to be uh, well mixed when it hits this reactor because it, or the interior of the reactor, because it, it follows a very tortuous path as it goes through the reactor uh, until it finally comes out um, and exits the reactor. So the well mixed approximation still pretty accurate um, because it's being mixed around pretty well. Um, constant volume still not too bad. Um, obviously all open to, to further refinement someday if, if you're interested in uh, refining the approximation. Um, so one of the big assumptions that we'll have with um, gas phase anything really um, is that all gases are ideal and specifically all gases and mixtures of gases are ideal. We've already seen this a couple of times. So this assumption was actually made in the energy balance that we had. This assumption was made back when we were looking at um, activities for our equilibrium reactors. Um, it, it's always ideal. It's, you, know, you always breathe a sigh of relief whenever you get to use the ideal gas law, um, life is good. So we will only be using the um, ideal gas law for something like this. The tricky part, and the reason why we feel pretty confident, like, okay, gas, ideal gas law is fine for now, is because it gets bad enough with just the gas law. Um, there's plenty of terms to follow with the ideal gas law that we don't have to worry about um, making things more complicated with a, a non-ideal gas. Nevertheless, you can go through the same derivation for a non-ideal gas and, and get similar um, behavior. So remember the, the ideal gas law looks like PV equals nRT. The P that we're talking about if we're on the inlet stream is the inlet pressure, which we call P0. The velocity, or sorry, the volume is not actually volume, right? Because we're dealing with a volumetric flow rate. So that's a lowercase v and it's got a circle on it. Um, the uppercase v will never show up inside of our ideal gas law. Um, we will never have to worry about that. Uh, and then that is gonna be equal to the total inlet molar flow rate uh, times the ideal gas constant uh, times T. And all of those have um, subscripts on them uh, because they are referring to the inlet. On the outlet side of the stream or outlet side of the reactor, the uh, ideal gas law still holds. So it's still PV equals NRT, uh, except there's no subscript, um, right? There's, there's no zero or anything like that um, because that is how we have defined our, our outlets. Um, two things to keep in mind are that the P that's being referred to here is the total pressure, right? And then the moles that's being referred to here are the total moles. That's to contrast this with things like partial pressures and molar space, uh, flow rates of individual species. Um, over on the um, outlet side, same idea. The P that we're referring to is the total pressure on the outlet stream. And the N sub T is the total outlet moles. 
or molar flow rates, right? It, it doesn't really matter if it's, uh, it has units of time or not. It, it, it's molar flow rates and volumetric flow rates or moles and volumes. Um, the units work out just the same. So this is our, our big uh, difference that we have uh, for gas phases than um, for liquids. Because as you'll recall for liquids, um, we were pretty careful whenever we were um, writing the liquids to always indicate that we were making an assumption that the inlet volumetric flow rate was approximately equal to the outlet volumetric flow rate. Um, and because of this, we often wrote something like C sub A was equal to the moles of A divided by V uh, volumetric flow rate. And that, that's true all the time, right? That's by definition, those two are related this way. Um, and often you would see me write something like N sub A over V zero. Uh, and then I would add a little arrow and say, we are allowed to do that uh, because V is equal to V zero for liquids. And that's not something that we can do anymore. Um, that is no longer the case for um, gases. Uh, and so we'll have to be a little bit more careful about the way that we handle that. In this case for gases, uh, we will never be able to assume at the outset that V is equal to, to V zero. So, this will not hold. Um, if you catch yourself writing that for a gas, double check. It may hold in some limited cases that we'll see here in a moment, but generally speaking, it will not hold. Um, the reason that it will not hold is because we can write the ideal gas law twice. Um, if we write the ideal gas law for the inlet, it's P0 V0 is equal to N T0 R T0. If we write it again for the outlet, um, PV is equal to N sub T R T, and then take the ratio of these two, right? So just take the ratio of one equation to another equation. What we end up with is a very general expression for the outlet volumetric flow rate that shows its dependence on all of the various terms um, that we can deal with. So N T over N T zero, T over T zero, and P zero over P. This is um, the most general form of that equation. So if you're solving something in MATLAB, that's a good equation to go to because it's usually you have all of that information readily accessible inside MATLAB, but that's equation 5.5 in your book. Um, in this particular uh, expression, the, I guess two things, it's, it's really one. These terms um, are the total molar flow rates, right? So N sub T zero is gonna be equal to something like NA zero if there's anything else coming in, there's, it's NB0. If there's inert coming in, which is very common in gas phase, it's plus the inerts, right? It, it's the sum of all of those entering the, the reactor. Uh, and similarly, any of the molar flow rates exiting the reactor as um, N sub T, uh, N sub T will be the sum of all of those. So NA, NB, et cetera, right? All the way up to however many components you happen to have in the, the reactor. Um, and that's important to keep in mind because it's very tempting to just substitute um, an individual component for one of those so that you can kind of do some quick math, um, but that's incorrect, unfortunately. The place where this comes up um, is in our rate laws, right? So uh, recall in your rate laws, it, it comes up in more than just the rate laws, but primarily it comes up in the rate laws. Rate laws often looked something like K, C sub A, C sub B, uh, or maybe it was K, C A squared, something like that, right? At any rate, there's, there's lots of these concentrations floating around, um, and they would often come up inside of our rate laws. And so we need to know how are those related to um, any of the, the terms in the ideal gas law. Uh, and the way to do that is to just substitute into the definition. So we still get to write that the concentration of any species, let's take A as an example, uh, is its molar flow rate divided by the volumetric flow rate. Uh, and again, the, the key point here is that for a gas, we will never be able to just write uh, Na uh, over V0. We're not gonna be able to write that. Um, not immediately. Like I said, it, it may come up that there are simple cases where that's the case, but more generally, the thing that you have to write right here is that big old mess of V0 NT over NT0, uh, T over T0, and P0 over P. Right, and that's the big difference between the liquids and the gases, um, is that the expression for concentration generally gets harder. So for, for gases, this is generally harder.
Um, but it, it's not the end of the world. Um, we, we can manage it. it. It just means that we have to track more terms um, throughout our uh, examples, but we can handle it. Um, and we're going to see another way to handle it uh, later this afternoon in the second half um, of today's lecture. So let's take a look at an example, um, and we'll point out uh, where the big difference shows up for this um, gas phase reactor versus a, a um, liquid phase reactor. So we'll start off with our classically shaped CSTR, right? Good old boxes for everybody. Which is kind of odd because for the first time we actually know, we have an idea, like a model of what's happening inside of our reactor, and yet we still draw it as a box. So just because we can sketch stuff on here, let's add the particles in there. Um, to indicate that this is a fluidized bed reactor. By the way, the, the reason for the particles, which I suppose I should um, at least comment once, uh, is that these particles are called catalysts. So these little dots that I'm drawing in there, uh, these are equal to catalyst particles. So those are often precious metals, so platinum, palladium, rhodium, something like that, or they can even be more common metals like copper. Um, and so they, they are often there to increase the rate of reaction, um, and so the reaction will only take place in the presence of a catalyst. On the other hand, it's really hard to get gas phase metal. Um, they're almost all metal, uh, and it, it's not easy to vaporize metal under most conditions. And so the, the way that we try to get a gas in close contact with a solid is we don't just make a slab of that solid and flow the gas along it. We break it up into particles and flow the gas over the particles. Um, and so that's, that's why we have these particles in there. A, a large number of uh, reactions are, are catalyzed um, and we need a good way to, to handle that. So our stream coming in over here will be pure A. It's going to come in at three kilomoles per hour, uh, and it's going to come in at 450 K and 200 kPa. Our outlet, uh, we don't really know what's coming out in our outlet. That's part of what we're going to calculate. Um, the reaction that takes place in here is A goes to 2B. So how do you get an, uh, a reaction like A goes to 2B? Usually the molecule breaks in half somehow. Um, it, it's hard to actually get it to go directly to 2B to get exactly the same molecules coming out the other side. Usually it's more like A goes to B plus C, like you break off a hydrogen group or a methyl group or something like that. But um, 2B is possible. Um, it's okay for this kind of an example. The rate will be um, elementary, so we are uh, also irreversible, which is nice, so our rate just looks like KCA. The rate constant um, under the conditions that we've got here is 2.3 per hour, and the volume of our reactor is pretty big, 6,000 liters. The, the trade-off with a, a big reactor volume is it's fairly dilute inside of there, right? It, it would be unlikely that you would make a a 6,000 liter liquid reactor, although those are, that's not too big. Um, but that's, gas phase reactors tend to be much larger than liquid phase reactors because you don't have to hold up all that mass. Um, 6,000 liters of, of water is a lot. Um, so you need quite a structure underneath it. But for a gas phase reactor, it's trivial, right? I, I mean, it doesn't add any more mass to the uh, support structure. I mean, you could build that uh, somewhat more easily than you would a reactor that's 6,000 liters that has to hold up liquid. Um, that's not easy. So our material balance uh, has not changed, right? And we're going to focus just on A here um, because we're going to use it in the second half of the uh, lecture after um, FICA. But the general material balance doesn't change, right? So we still get to write zero is equal to n sub a minus n sub a zero minus r sub a times v. And our, our goal here for, th for this particular approach will be find out what n sub a is, right? n sub a is what is leaving the reactor. Um, and so if, if we can write every term in here in terms of either a, a constant or n sub a, then we'll be left with one equation and one unknown, and we'll be able to somehow solve that, right? Maybe not analytically, uh, but we'll be able to work with it. Um, so we're already good on 
two of these, right? We're okay on n sub a, actually three of them. We don't have to worry about solving for that because that's the thing we're trying to solve for. So we don't have to expand that at all. Um, n sub a zero, um, we're gonna have to work on that one a little bit because we don't know it right away. Uh, and then r sub a is, is gonna be a mess, uh, but we know v, uh, which is the volume of our reactor, which is 6,000 uh, liters. So for the inlet conditions, let's tackle, um, oh wait, no, sorry, we do know n sub a zero. It was given to us as three kilomoles per hour. So we're good with that one. But we are going to need something else eventually for our inlet. Um, and so we're going to start our analysis there. Uh, and this is more of a reminder uh, that the ideal gas law is still a thing. So we can always use the ideal gas law on the inlet. Um, and I bring this up because often when you're writing a homework problem, if, if you forget that the ideal gas law holds, sometimes I have overspecified a problem and it violates the ideal gas law and you look kind of dumb. Um, so whenever I design these homework problems, I, I remind myself, don't forget the ideal gas law holds. So what this means on the um, inlet is that the inlet temperature T0 is 450 K. And I'm just writing these out here so that there's no um, mystery to how they relate to the drawing versus what we use in the um, equation. P0 will be um, 200 kPa. Um, and our N sub T0 is three kilomoles per hour. Per hour. This N sub T0 happens to be equal to N sub A0 since puree. But that's not always the case, right? If we're feeding more than one component in there, the n, to n sub t0 will not be the same as n sub a0. So it just so happens in this particular case that I said it was puree coming in, um, and so we got lucky there. Um, n sub t0 is the same as n sub a0. We can then use the ideal gas law to calculate what the inlet volumetric flow rate is. Why do I know it, or why do I want to know this? I wrote the problem, I know I need to know it, but anytime that I need a concentration, I know I'm gonna need the outlet molar flow rate or outlet volumetric flow rate, and I know it's gonna be proportional to the inlet volumetric flow rate. So if you have the information, it's usually worthwhile to calculate the inlet volumetric flow rate because you're probably gonna need it elsewhere. Um, and so we can always apply the ideal gas law as NT0, RT0 over P0 um, to calculate a volumetric flow rate or any of the missing terms, right? If I tell you temperature, pressure, and volumetric flow rate, then you can back out the moles, um, or you know, any, any three, uh, you can use the um, ideal gas law to get the fourth. Five, six, one, two, zero liters per hour. Just be careful with R, right? This is, you've used the ideal gas law before. You know how tricky the units on R can be. Um, it's, it's often helpful to just put everything in terms of a, a common unit before you get started so that you can use as few values of R as you want. Gas phase problems, you typically need two values of R, one of them for like a, a pressure times a volume divided by mole per temperature, and then another one as energy per mole per temperature. Um, and those are summarized in Appendix D in your book. They're, they're split, right? Sometimes you can write as R as energy um, and sometimes as, as pressure times volume. So just look up the right value of R that you need um, and make sure you're um, dimensionally consistent. So our, actually, let me leave a little bit of that in case anybody is still writing. Our rate law is usually where the nasty stuff comes in. So R sub A, uh, we know is gonna be equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of A times R, which is a minus one. And R, because it is, uh, actually it's just given to us, but it's an elementary reaction. We're left with KCA. The definition of KCA or definition of CA is moles of A leaving divided by volumetric flow rate going out of the, the tank. So we're okay since our goal is to solve for N sub A, we're okay leaving the N sub A there. K was given to us as a constant, but we have to work on the, the volume term on the bottom. And that's where we plug in the big old expression that we had before. So N sub A V0, N sub T over N sub T0, T over T0, and P0 over P, right? And now we have to check each of these terms. Um, often, at least with um, CSTRs, so we will look at, we'll fix this solution or fix this limitation later with other types of reactors, um, but this term 
is usually close to one. Uh, and the reason is that CSTRs are nearly always isobaric and fluidized beds are very frequently isobaric, um, which is to say that the, the pressure across the bed is very small or the pressure drop across the bed is very small. Um, and so the R pressure terms there happen to be pretty small. Um, just for convenience sake, we're gonna assume that the system is iso also isothermal. Um, and so this term will also be, that one will actually be exactly equal to one. Um, did we drop the K? No, we did not mean to drop the K. Thank you for pointing that out. We didn't mean to drop the negative sign either. So that's supposed to be there too. Um, if the system is not isothermal, then the, it just gets coupled to the energy balance in the same way that we've used um, before. So the, there's no change with um, how a non-isothermal system is uh, controlled or, or, or handled in terms of the math. It's just that temperature pops up in one more place that you have to worry about. The N sub T over N sub T zero. Um, let's start with uh, N sub T zero. N sub T zero in this case happens to be equal to Na0 um, because we said a moment ago that this happened to be pure A. Uh, and so we got lucky there, right? N sub T0, we don't have to do any more math uh, in order to um, calculate N sub T0. The other one though, N sub T usually requires some effort. Um, and it's not always the case that you can write something quite as, as clean as what we're gonna write it as here. So we know that N sub T has to be equal to Na plus NB because there's nothing else in the system, right? There's only A and B. That's the only thing that N sub T can be is, is um, moles of A plus moles of B, or molar flow rate of A plus molar flow rate of B. We know from uh, stoichiometry that the moles of B is two times the change in moles, or two squiggle, which happens to be Na0 minus Na. That's the part that, like, that's, that's not always the case, right? It's not always the case that you can write something this easy, that you can write N sub B is equal to this, but this is coming from stoichiometry. If you are lucky, you'll be able to write something like that. If you are unlucky, you will not be able to write something like that, and you'll have to add another equation uh, in order to solve for n sub b. In order to solve for n sub b, you write the material balance on b, and now you've got another unknown. Um, so it, it's not the end of the world if you can't write an expression like that, but it sure does make life easier if you can. Um, usually that only happens if you um, I have a single reaction. Can you write something like that? If you have more than one reaction, boy, I don't know if you're going to be able to write something like that. It's, it's usually pretty tough um, to write something like that. Uh, so we can then write N sub T will be equal to two times Na zero. Uh, let's see, we'll have minus that and then minus N sub A. So with a little bit of stoichiometry, we can express N sub T in, in terms of constants in Na. And again, the reason for that is because we wanna solve for Na. That's the um, variable that we're, we're trying to, to solve for. So if I dump all of this into R sub A, what I end up with is R sub A is minus K. I'm gonna pull the NT zero up on the top. Uh, so we'll have N sub A and T0, uh, and then a V0 on the bottom. Remember the two temperature ratio, or the, the two ratios, the temperature ratio and the pressure ratio, those are gone because it's isothermic, isothermal, um, and very close to isobaric, um, which will always be the case. The, the isobaric case will always be the case. Uh, and then it'll be essentially multiplied by N sub T. Uh, but we said N sub T is two Na0 minus Na. Right, so this term here, that's our N sub T. The N sub T zero, I just moved up to the top just so that I don't have to have, what are those fractions? They're like nested fractions or something where it's like a fraction as a fraction as a fraction. It gets tedious to write all of that. So um, I just moved the N, N T zero up on the top. The key point of this uh, is that this is now a function of N sub A. Right, everything else in here we know. We know N sub T zero, and A zero is given. We just calculated V zero a minute ago, um, and K is given as a constant. So the only unknown at compound fractions. Thank you, John. Um, I hate, sometimes you're stuck with compound fractions, but if you can avoid it, do it. Um, but everything there is just a function of, of N sub A. So we can now write our material balance as zero is equal to N sub A minus N sub A zero. 
the two negative signs will flip themselves around, so we'll be left with k n a n t zero divided by v zero two n a zero minus n a. Right, so this big thing is just um, another way of writing an equation in root finding form. So if I change my colors here, this is the same thing as zero is equal to a function of n sub a times v. Yes, thank you. Don't forget your v. Volume v up on the top. So this is our typical root finding form. And so we can dump that into any old solver that we want. That thing looks like it ought to end up being something that you could actually solve by hand if you wanted to sort of play around with it and isolate the um, n sub a. But uh, I don't know, As sooner or later you get to the point where you, you have to decide for yourself, I bet I can solve that thing by hand. Whether or not I want to is, is a different matter. The key point though is that at this point we are done with sort of the, the engineering hat. It's now a question of how do I solve that thing for its unknown. Um, that's the math portion of the hat. So um, however you choose to go about solving that, what you will end up with is that n sub a will be equal to about 2480 moles per hour. Did I say 3000? or three, no, I was right, yeah, 3,000 uh, moles were coming in. I was, I was trying to make sure that my units were right there. I didn't um, want to mess that up. Right, so we end up with a, a, a number 2480, which produ produces a, a pretty small um, conversion, n sub a divided by n sub a zero is about 0 0.173, pretty small, like 17%. Although, I don't know, I mean, maybe you only need 17%. So it was a made up problem. So who knows what, if, if that's good enough for you, then it's good enough for you. You can decide that for yourself. So the, again, the, the general approach here that I, I wanted to emphasize was we're still stuck solving the material balance, right? The, the difference is that our R sub A term here usually looks quite a bit nastier. And the origin of that nastiness is that the outlet volumetric flow rate is now this big old expression. Um, if the system is non-isothermal, then the temperature that sits in there is now coupled to the energy balance and you have to solve them both um, simultaneously. Um, which is not, it, it, it actually doesn't make it too much harder, at least in MATLAB, uh, because you already have the, the value of T available. If you're doing it by hand, it's basically impossible to solve a gas phase problem um, that's coupled to the energy balance, right? A non-isothermal gas phase problem is really difficult to solve by hand. I had mentioned a moment ago that there are cases where the, the volumes um, are or the, the volumetric flow rate going out uh, is equal to the volumetric flow rate going in. So let's add that as one of the two comments that we have on here. So two comments for gas phase. The um, first comment is that if V is equal to V zero times NT over NT zero, T over T zero, P0 over P. If that is the case, then under what conditions could the two be um, equal, right? Under what conditions could V be equal to, to V0? Well, if it's isothermal, then you'll get rid of this, right? That'll be equal to one. If it is isobaric, then you can get rid of this one. All of our CSTRs will always be isobaric. They will not always be isothermal, but they will always be isobaric. And so the, the um, remaining one comes, well, when is it the case that n sub t is equal to n sub t zero? That's the case when the stoichiometry is, is perfectly balanced. So this occurs when you have delta is equal to zero. So what are the reactions that look like delta is equal to zero? Those are the ones where you have something like A goes to B or A plus B goes to two C or 2a goes to b plus c, something like that, right? In all of these cases, if you sum up the stoichiometric coefficients, they will all be equal to zero. 
And what that means is that we're not generating or destroying any moles, right? It's okay to generate and destroy moles. Moles are not a conserved quantity. Um, it's okay to take a molecule and break it in half and end up with two molecules. It's perfectly fine. Uh, but on cases where the thing is maybe just isomerizing, right? So it, it, you're taking a linear molecule, maybe you're just bending it, so you haven't destroyed or created any moles. Um, or if you're taking two things and you're sticking them together, um, or I, I should say if you're taking two things and exchanging groups so that you still end up with two things. Um, in those cases, then um, V will be equal to V0, but only if it's isothermal, isobaric, and delta is equal to zero. That's a, a pretty narrow range of, of um, conditions where that can happen, but it can happen. Um, there, there's nothing stopping the inlet volumetric flow rate from being equal to the vo outlet volumetric flow rate. It just requires a, a fairly uh, restrictive set of, of conditions, um, which is reactions like that. So you can always um, estimate that. This, by the way, uh, is we, we have actually seen this um, in a, a previous portion of the um, textbook, if you go way back to um, chapter two, uh, we have actually written an expression for the, the total outlet uh, molar flow rate um, as a function of the inlet and delta. So if you dig back through chapter two, that is, is um, already defined. And we're gonna look at it again um, tomorrow or this afternoon. So that's the first comment. The second comment um, is that partial pressures are very common. So all of our, um, Rate laws so far have been in terms of concentrations, but if you remember the uh, chapter three work that we did with rate laws, um, the other form of rate laws uh, can be uh, ones that use partial pressures. Partial pressures. The reason for that is twofold. One, it actually makes a lot, the math a lot easier, um, but usually that's not an excuse. If, if the math is easier, but it doesn't represent reality, that's not a good excuse. Um, the other reason, the, the more practical reason is it's very easy to control partial pressure, um, or at least easier than it is to control uh, something like molar concentration when you're dealing with a, a gas phase fluid. Um, and so partial pressure in rates, remember that'll look like things like K times partial pressure of A, or maybe it was rate is K times partial pressure of A times partial pressure of B, right? Those come up more often. Um, and so let, we should at least briefly review partial pressures. Um, this is no different than chemistry's partial pressures. Um, but it, again, it's one of those cases where maybe you haven't used it in a while or, or maybe our syntax is a little bit different. Um, so I think it's, it's worth at least briefly reviewing these. The partial pressure of any species I is its mole fraction in the gas phase times the, to the total pressure. Um, and its mole fraction is N sub I over N sub T, right? So the moles of whatever I is um, times, or divided by the total number of moles. Um, that's sort of like the, the definition of, of partial pressure. There's a couple of useful, um, uh, I guess, conversions that we can do. So from the ideal gas law, we know that um, PV is equal to NTRT, uh, or inlets, right? You could add a subscript zero to those if you wanted to. If you rearrange these a little bit, um, what you can find is that the ratio of pressure divided by total moles is equal to RT divided by the volumetric flow rate. That happens to be useful because in the definition of partial pressure, you have the ratio of P over NT, which is why that's a, a useful quantity to, to keep in mind. Um, if you have that quantity and you write the definition of partial pressure is YI times P, and you substitute that into this expression, what you end up with is N sub I over V times RT. Right, so I've replaced the P over NT with RT over V. Um, and now this parameter happens to be equal to the concentration of I. So concentration of I times RT. So the three most common ways that we will see partial pressure are the three most common ways that you need it, if you need it. It's just the plain old partial pressure. So for example, that could show up in like a rate law or something like that. Occasionally you might have to calculate the partial pressure as its mole fraction times total pressure. And that can always be related to molar concentration, which is this way. So that's perfectly fine. The only thing you should never do, um, you, you can 
change your calculations back and forth um, if you want to, but generally don't try to change the rate law um, because remember the, the rate law discussions that we had last week, um, these units on K depend on the units of whatever follows that, right? Whether it's partial pressure or concentration. So just don't change the rate law. You can use those calculations uh, to go into here. So I can take any of these that I have here and use them to calculate the values that are in there, but don't try to switch the rate laws around. Um, it, it can, you technically can, but it, it's often a mess of unit conversions. So just leave the rate law however it was given. Um, and that's also a good habit to be in because generally if you're ever given a rate law, don't mess with it um, because it was probably derived for, for specific um, situations. Um, the V in the, uh, Ideal gas law, there was a question in chat, what's the, the V that's sitting here? This is nearly always, in fact, I'm just gonna say it's always because I don't think there will ever be a case where it's not, uh, volumetric flow rate. So we're always referring, you're, we're always using our ideal gas law on the inlets and the outlets, never on the, the chunk of the reactor itself. Um, so it will always be a volumetric flow rate. The capital V, the volume, uh, remember if I wanted to write uh, volume, I will write that as V with two caps on it. So this is the reactor volume. I cannot think of a time where the ideal gas law, in, at least in this class, will ever be used with capital V. Um, uh, it's just, it's not gonna happen. So, so don't worry about that part. It's not that the two won't show up close to each other. Um, they, they will, uh, and in fact, they did, right? We already showed in our, our previous example, the two Vs can definitely show up close to each other, right? There can be a V here and a V here. Uh, that's how it goes, that's not gonna go away. Um, but in the direct use of the ideal gas law, it's always gonna be the um, volumetric flow rate. Um, yeah, so there was a, another question of chat. Can I do the same thing for the outlets? Yep, or sorry, for the inlets. You could write PI0 is equal to YI0 P0, which is also equal to CI0 times RT0. Perfectly fine, right? The, the ideal gas holds separately for the outlet than it does for the inlet, but it holds for both of them. Um, everywhere that the gases exist, the, the ideal gas law holds. Um, and so we can do either of those. So you will have a, a question in your homework, um, homework three, that will have rate laws as functions of, of partial pressures. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can go about doing that. The only thing that I would suggest is don't change the rate law, right? You can calculate the partial pressure by any of the methods that I've shown down here, um, yi times p, if that's convenient, if you prefer to calculate concentration first and then multiply by rt to get partial pressure, also perfectly fine. Um, whichever way you choose to do it is fine. Just leave the um, rate laws alone. So generally leave these as given. And that's consistent with what we went over when we were talking about rate laws to begin with, which is if somebody gives you a rate law, use it the way that it's given. Don't, you know, multiply by factors of two or something like that. Um, confused if a fluidized bed reactor is a gas going through a solution of gas. It's a gas going through a suspension of particles. Um, so this, uh, where did I, there it is, right up here. Yeah, the particles are solid. So they're, think like sand. Um, or uh, if you've ever shot a BB gun, think you know, little copper BBs, um, something like that. So those, those particles, actually that was, we got Fika here in a minute. Um, I'll put that uh, screen that I had earlier back up again. Those are little tiny plastic particles that were in there. So the, the particles, the catalysts that are inside of there um, are solid particles. Um, they don't leave the reactor, they just sit inside of the reactor um, and the gas flows around them. You can do a fluidized bed, by the way, with a liquid. Um, if you need to, but it's less common. So let's leave that as our, our summary page. We are spot on time um, because that's exactly what I wanted to get through for the, the first lecture. Um, we're actually about five minutes early or so, um, but I have never complained about too much Fika. So I will um, throw on, maybe I'll do different music than what I had a moment ago, um, but throw on some music for Fika. I have, today coconut cookies, um, which is 
just saying i've had coconut cookies before but they're always delicious um little winston is behind me he's napping but if he wakes up while i'm making coffee um i will try to put him on screen but we will have fika until three um, if you see me in front of the computer, I'm going to step away for just a second. Uh, but if you see me in front of the computer, uh, feel free to, to shoot me a question over in chat. Um, chat's open too, if you want to talk to anybody else. I'll throw on some music. Oh no, that was all one. Let's draw it in chunks. And we will be back at three o'clock. Let's turn on a little bit of... Oh, where'd my share go? There we go. Share sound. Let me find something other than the techno dance music that we had. I, I thought that was, it was pretty good music. Um, let's see, ice flow. Ah, oh, fluffing a duck is always good. Let's do fluffing a duck. Here we go. Cool beans. So I will see you guys back here at three, but again, I'll, I'll be sitting physically right here. So if you got questions, shoot them in the chat. John's here too. If you got any um, questions for John, throw them our way.
let's see a couple of questions popped up on the chat let's see if i can knock these out real quick let's see okay john's got office hours there so he's updated those for question four i can't seem to find the units of x BH and XBA on the suggested tables. Where can I find the units? Uh, good question. Let's find out. ASMX description. Oh, there we go. Next coming through. Table two at the bottom. Cool. Um, John says use the same meeting ID for Canvas. Sure. Um, email I sent on in these classrooms. Oh, yeah. Um, Michelle, should it be in my um, email right now? Okay, let me take a look at it. welcome. And will the last lecture 13 be posted to YouTube? Oh, um, I think it's up. Oh, no, I think I've only got the um, Canvas one up. Uh, so I will put that up right after this one. Um, during the lecture, did I hear you correctly that CSTR is always isobaric? Uh, the CSTR model that we will use, whether it's liquid or gas phase, yes, will al always be isobaric. But that will not be the case for the next two reactors that we have that we'll get to uh, later next week. But for a CSTR, yes, um, always isobaric, but not isothermal necessarily.
And so the L that you're seeing is a, a generic length unit. So when it says um, L to the cube, it means take any length measurement you have and cube it. So that could be something like a centimeter cubed, a meter cubed, uh, really doubt it would ever be a, a kilometer cubed that's really really big um, but when you when you see those generic units like l to the cube or uh, t to the one or m to the one or something like that those are the the base units of mass length and time so when you see something like l to the minus three it means per volume right per unit length cubed which is volume Yeah, on, on problem five, just pick one of the utilities. It, the other one should be like weird to use, like it wouldn't make sense to, only one of them would make logical sense to use, right? You either need to heat it with steam or cool it with water, uh, but not both. Ooh, we got another units problem question for the uh, project. I'm gonna let everybody else work on that one. Yeah, that, that's correct for the, the question in tap, chat. The only time that you can use that concentration is density over molar mass is if it's pure. I mean, it, it technically holds all the time, but the, the calculation is really problematic when it's a mixture. So for practical purposes, the only time you would ever use that equation is if it's pure. So for example, if you needed like the concentration of pure water, um, for, for some reason, the molar concentration of pure water, you could use that density over molar mass expression. Um, for the, the project, the, the big ideas should be uh, typed up. So for example, when I ask you to um, show me what the reaction rate is for the species, those should be typed up. Um, but if you're, I don't know, doing like a, an intermediate calculation somewhere along the way, like you don't, you don't have to show every step of the derivation in typed up um, expressions. But if, for example, I ask you in the appendix to say, show me what this rate law is, that single portion should be just typed up. You could then have like a picture of your work underneath it, but there should be one clearly written um, typed up piece uh, for that kind of thing. Uh, for dimensional consistency, yeah, I would type that up. All right, that's our 15 minute uh, Fika. It always goes by so fast. Um, I guess while, while the music is still on, before we 
start the second half of the lecture today. Um, there was a, an announcement that um, Michelle with AICHG wanted me to post real quick, uh, which is now um, shown on the, the notes page here. Um, so it looks like they've got a um, project showcase coming up. So they're going to you know, demonstrate some of the projects they've been uh, working on. So you can see the uh, date there is um, May 2nd. And then following that, they've also got a networking event on uh, May 5th. Um, and so if you're interested in either one of those, the links are here. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, you're just going to have to type those links in. Um, actually, or if you're watching the recording and you have access to the current Canvas page, I'll post the links there too, so you can just click on them. Um, or you can check over in uh, chat. I also posted them um, in chat like what, seven minutes ago, something like that. So AICHE too. All right, let's uh, stop with the duck. Pause that. Uh, and we will go to our um, second topic for today. So the, the first topic, the fluidized bed reactor, um, is take a CSTR and what happens if you have gas phase. Um, and that's section 5.1 in your book. Um, the next special case is take a CSTR but write everything in terms of, of conversion. Um, and so this can be um, a very useful way to, to find um, important parameters, but it has some, some pretty big limitations uh, that we're gonna talk about. So the general idea is uh, rewriting the CSTR um, MB and EB, the material balance and energy balance, as functions of conversion, right? So function of X sub A. Something that you probably noticed in a fair number of the homework problems up to now, and even in the classes uh, or the in-class examples, um, is that we often end up using conversion as some kind of a, a helpful tool along the way, right? We, we want to know how big of a reactor do we need to get 50% conversion or something like that. Um, but we always started off with the, the general material balance, right? And then along the way, we found out, oh, I could also substitute in conversion here and calculate something helpful and then go on with the problem. Um, it's also possible to just rewrite the material balance in the first place in terms of conversion. The big limitation for this um, is that this only works if you have one reaction. If you have more than one reaction, do not do this. Um, it will not be beneficial to you. Uh, and the reason being, we cannot split the conversion of a component um, up by its contributions from different reactions. So this is a very key limitation of what we're about to talk about. Don't try this if we've got more than one reaction. If you have more than one reaction, just go back to the general one. If you have just one reaction, you can use either one. They will both work. You will get exactly the same answer um, both times. So if you have one reaction, you can give this form a shot um, if you want to. Since we have only one reaction, only one reaction, this implies that we are only interested in A, whatever A happens to be. Um, again, A varies, right? Sometimes it's the limiting reactant, sometimes it's the one that's the most uh, expensive to purchase. Those usually tend to be the same thing. Um, but whatever A happens to be, you know, that, that is the thing for which all of the variables will be um, expressed as functions of. So what we're going to do um, is take two components of uh, equations that we've seen before. So the general material balance is Na minus Na0 minus RAV. Obviously that will still hold, that will not break um, in any way. But what we're gonna do is combine that with our definition of X sub A as in minus out over in. And we're gonna see where that takes us. It's not gonna be a very long trip. It's gonna take like two lines. Um, this by the way is um, section 5.2 in your book. The stuff from earlier today was 5.1. So if we take uh, the general material balance and just rearrange it, right? Don't do any math, just re, well, okay, that's algebra. Don't substitute anything in, just rearrange it. What you end up with is Na minus Na zero uh, divided by R sub A. That's supposed to be a zero, not an E. Zero. 
right? So all I did was rearrange that. Um, if we now take that expression and combine it with this expression, um, so basically just replace the Na minus Na naught on the top, what we end up with is the volume of the reactor uh, is equal to Na zero times X sub A divided by minus Ra. And that's it, right? That was not a very long derivation. It did not take us very long to get here. This is an equivalent statement of the CSTR material balance, but it only holds if you have one reaction. So I'm gonna keep underlining that. Don't try to use that uh, form if you have more than one reaction. If you have more than one, just go back to equation 4.1, the, the general material balance, and it will serve you just fine. Um, this in your book is equation 5.8. Um, right underneath it, uh, 5.9, is the energy balance. And it just looks a little bit nastier because there's, there's not as, few, as many simplifications as you can make for that one, but it, it's similar steps, right? You, you replace some NAs and some NA zeros with functions of XA, you do some rearranging and you get 5.9. Um, the derivation of that one is, is not, um, I think, illuminating enough that it's, it's worth going over. It follows the same general idea as, as what we've got here. And we don't really need it all that often anyway. So the key point here is everything is expressed in terms of species A to begin with, but also the conversion of A, right? The idea is we want to use conversion as a helpful tool to actually solve the problem, not just a number that we calculate along the way as like a process specification or something like that. Um, and so since we've got the R sub A here, we need to be able to express R sub A as a function of conversion. That takes a little bit. Um, it, it's along the same lines as the ideal gas law for the, the gas phase stuff. What ends up happening is this gets nastier and nastier and nastier as things get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but that's the way that it goes sometimes. By the way, I had mentioned there were two reasons for writing it in terms of X sub A. One is that, um, for one reaction, X of A is a useful number to calculate. Uh, another is that sometimes the math can be easier. Um, a third is that if you're interested in getting a, a FE exam certification or a, a PE certification, something like that, a lot of the problems that will show up for the reaction engineering course for that can be more quickly solved in terms of conversion. Um, and so it can save yourself a little bit of time. On the other hand, it's like five hour exam or something. So you've got time. So to work with this, this is what we're going to have to work on, right? Because we're going to need some more general expressions than we've, we've seen before for um, R sub A. Generally, what we start with uh, is that the moles of I are equal to however much I was coming in minus the moles of A times the stoichiometric coefficient of I divided by stoichiometric coefficient of A times X sub A. That may not look terribly familiar just because we haven't used it in a couple of weeks, but this was equation 2.37. Um, and we often use it when we were writing up our table of wonder. Right, if we wanted to know what was coming out of our equilibrium reactor, stoichiometry tells us that it's related to what was going in minus whatever the change was, or, or I should say plus whatever the change was. And the, the, the pluses and minus get worked out by the, the stoichiometric coefficients. So this is not a material balance, this is stoichiometry, right? It is saying the two are related through their stoichiometry. We introduce a, a new term in here because again, we're, we're very interested in A. We're not interested in writing it in terms of anything else other than A. So we define a capital theta. A capital theta, if you've never written a capital theta before, looks like a circle with a little squat H inside of it. Um, that is what a capital theta looks like. It, it looks much better in text if you look it up in the book. So that is a capital theta. Um, this is defined as the inlet moles of anything divided by the inlet moles of A. Why is that helpful? Because again, we're, if we're only interested in A, we wanna try to write as much as we can in terms of A. Um, and so this is one way that uh, we do it. And so if you let theta equal the ratio of the inlet molar flow rates, you can then write that the outlet molar flow rate of anything, N sub I, 
is equal to n sub a zero times theta i minus the stoichiometric coefficient of i divided by that of a times x sub a. Why did we introduce a brand new term there? That's unfortunately some of the, the habits that we get into have been made a long time ago. You need to know that the theta exists because other people use theta um, and that's what it means. It's just the inlet ratio of the um, inlet molar flow rates. Sorry, ratio of the inlet molar flow rates. This number, by the way, is constant. It can be tempting to um, write that as not constant. So it, this, this is not the same not the same as n sub i over n sub a. That is not the case. Um, so those, those are not uh, the same thing. I had no idea. That is a sideways green lantern, isn't it? I dig it. I always thought it looked like um, there's a guy on Reddit that draws cartoons, Senior Grafo, and he always draws his faces like that. I always thought it looked like that. Anyway, for liquids, let's see how this affects the world, right? We're, we're interested in rate laws, which often have uh, concentrations inside of them. Concentrations are molar flow rates divided by volumetric flow rates. So we often get two separate expressions for liquids. So we want to try to write C sub A as a function of X sub A, or C sub a is a function of x sub a. We would like to be able to do that in anticipation of needing to write a rate in terms of x sub a, and our x's, or sorry, our rates often have to do with concentration. So if we wanted to do something like that, uh, and maybe our rate was kCa, kCb, or maybe it was kCa, I don't know, minus K, C, B, C, C. Generally, what we're interested in is how do we write the concentration of any species, whether it's A or B or C or whatever, how do we write the concentration of any species in terms of the um, concentration of A um, or conversion of A or something like that? So we start with the general expression for C sub I, which is moles of I divided by V. Still get that, right? That, that does not change whether it's liquid or gas or or whatever, um, we always get that. Let's substitute in some uh, things that we know. First thing to do for um, n sub i, let's substitute in what we just wrote above, which is Na zero times theta i minus stoichiometric coefficient of i over a times x sub a, right? So if we take this expression and just use it directly, right? Right, right inside of there. We also get that V is equal to V zero uh, because this is a liquid, right? So I get to go from here to here because it's a liquid. Great, that's not too shabby at all. There's a, a quantity that's written right here. This Na zero over V zero, that ratio happens to be equal to Ca zero, right? By definition, we, there are no assumptions there. We see the, the ratio Na0 over V0 that is defined as V0 or Ca0. So we can always write that. So this expression ends up looking like the concentration of anything inside of that reactor is proportional to the concentration of C as Ca0 that's coming in times theta I minus stoichiometric coefficient of I over A times X sub A. That's cool, right? That's what we were after. This is actually uh, equation 5.11 in your book. So if the, the, the workflow that we have there would be figure out that our rate law exists as some function of concentration, take each of the concentrations that are in there, each concentration that we have, each C sub I is represented by one of these terms. So that can look really nasty really fast, right? If, if it's a reversible reaction or something like that, you can have lots of those terms floating around, but it, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's, it's doable. The fun is the gas phase reaction. Let's look at the gas phase reaction. That one is worse. Um, and by worse, I mean awesome. Uh, because if you ever want to impress somebody with how good you are at math and they don't really know math, 
show them one of these calculations and they'll just be like, I don't know what you're doing, but it looks really smart. The problem with gases is we still need C sub A as a function of X sub A, which is great, but V is not equal to V zero. That makes our life difficult. The approach is exactly the same. So the approach is that we start off with C sub I is always equal to N sub I over V. We can still write the top. That's how you know it's good, right? When you draw a ratio that's that long, this is, this is gonna be great. You're gonna love this. N sub A zero times, you mean not equal? No, no, so this is actually true. Um, so the question in chat was, do I mean not equal here? Um, no, I mean equal here. Uh, that particular definition holds, right? The thing that I can't do is say that n sub i is, or v is equal to v zero because this is a liquid, but it's still n sub i over v. Oh yes, but thank you. Now I see what you mean. Yes, this should be not equal to zero. Uh, n sub a zero theta i minus stoichiometric coefficient of i stoichiometric coefficient of a times x sub a. Remember when we want to write the denominator down here on the bottom, we have that V is equal to V zero, N sub T over N sub T zero, T over T zero, P zero over P. The few terms that don't change are V zero. We still get to write a V zero here. Then we're gonna have a big term that sits in here. And then we're gonna have T over T zero, P zero over P. Right, so uh, the V zero makes its way right up here. And then the T zero and the uh, P zero, those just get used directly right over here. The problematic term here, the one that makes this so much bigger is this term, N sub T over N sub T zero. What this looks like if we write out um, this term, N sub T over N sub T zero, you have to go back to, um, chapter two. Uh, if you go back to chapter two, you can see that we have occasionally written uh, n sub t as equal to uh, n sub t zero, which I got to make sure I remember where this is, minus n a zero times delta over the stoichiometric coefficient of a times x a. That we have actually used before whenever we did a, a table of wonder, if we had to add up all of the, the moles coming out, um, there was two ways, right? We could just add up all of the moles, Na plus Nb plus Nc, um, or we could add it up this way um, and get the same answer. So what this is saying is the total number of moles leaving the system is equal to whatever was coming in minus this sort of product between however much A reacted and whatever the change is per unit mole of A that got reacted. Um, so that was not an expression that we really had to use a lot, but it was back there in chapter two um, for whenever we used our um, table of wonder. And so our n sub t0 goes on the bottom. So the n sub t0 over t, sorry, n sub t0 over n sub t0, this one is just equal to one, which is great. This one, na0 over um, nt0, this is defined as the inlet mole fraction of a, which previously we have not really needed. Um, it, it has come up on one of our uh, homework problems, but other than that, we haven't really used it as a problem solving tool a lot. So this ratio ends up being one minus YA zero uh, times delta divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of A uh, times the conversion of A. So this is the term then that goes inside of our um, parenthesis, one minus YA zero delta over the stoichiometric coefficient of A times XA. Right, that's not as bad as I made it out to be a minute ago. I was having fun because how fun is CSTR stuff? It's pretty fun actually. I dig this stuff. Uh, there's something here that's stuck. Let's delete it. There we go. Uh, and then I'm just gonna clean up this um, expression a little bit just so that we've got uh, a little bit neater of an expression to work with. I'm just gonna move this to about there and then I'm gonna move this 
over to here. Now, the, the question that this begs is, is this really any easier than the general approach? Uh, it can be. Um, I don't, I don't say that I often go to this expression initially. Um, are the thetas still capitalized? Yeah, technically they're still capitalized, but I'm bad at drawing capital thetas. Um, is it necessarily any easier than using the full version? I can't say I go here uh, initially because I think this happens to be a, a fairly complicated expression. Um, but at the same time, if you've only got one reaction in there, this expression is doing an awful lot of the stoichiometry and the, the um, types of calculations that uh, we would have had to do anyway, right? They're just summarized in one expression. As anticlimactic, I know, I was setting you up to, to make it seem like it was more impressive than it really is. Um, but that's a pretty big expression, right? Remember, there is one of these. For every C sub i that you have. That can be a lot, right? If, if your rate has three C sub i's in there, you have three of these expressions floating around. They tend to simplify a fair amount because they share a lot of similar values, but it can be tricky uh, to, to track down everything that's in there. Um, so it, it's extensive, um, but that is summarized as equation 5.14. Um, just keep in mind it only works for one reaction. Um, if you have more than one reaction, don't try um, to use that. So let's see how to use that. Let's solve exactly the same problem that we did a moment ago, but see how all of this comes together. So as an example, solve the previous problem with X sub A. And so that's sort of my way of saying I would like you to use the material balance that has been written in terms of X sub A. If I don't tell you how to solve it, use whatever you want. Um, you can do that just fine. On this particular homework, I've asked you in a, a couple of explicit places, solve it with X sub A. That means use these expressions that we've been working on here that are functions of X sub A. You can always check your work with something else. Um, you can check your work with the, the long form version. Um, but if I ask you to specifically solve it with X sub A, what I mean is start with your material balance on A as what we have just shown here, right? Volume is equal to n sub a zero x sub a over minus r a, or whatever a is. I think in one of the problems I asked you for, I think the, the key component was e for ethylene, so you would solve it in terms of ethylene x sub e, um, but whatever you want, uh, as long as you're starting from this particular material balance instead of the, the general one. So, with a, a situation like this, we already know the volume. That was 6,000 liters from before. Uh, we don't know X sub A, but that's okay because we're trying to find out what X sub A is. Um, and we already know the inlet um, molar flow rate. I believe this was, I think it was three kilomoles per hour. Um, it could have been just two, but I think it was three kilomoles per hour for our um, inlet volumetric flow rate, uh, and so, or sorry, inlet molar flow rate, we're left with this R sub A. So we're going to have to work on that. So in this expression, R sub A is equal to minus the stoichiometric coefficient of A times R, uh, which is minus R. The rate was elementary, um, and so we had KCA. And now we have to write out what is KCA, uh, or is really what is C sub A. It's gas phase, so we need the big one. Um, if we start off with the full version, which is CA0, theta A minus stoichiometric coefficient of A divided by stoichiometric coefficient of A, XA, all of that divided by one minus, oh, did I forget my, no, it's on there, one minus YA0, times delta over stoichiometric coefficient of A, X sub A, and then our ratios for temperature and pressure. Right, think for a moment if it was CA times CB, right? It would be this times another one that looks like that. If it was reversible and it was like CA times CB minus CC times CD over KC, this gets really um, lengthy. Uh, so the, there's a 
question in chat, and I thought I had actually initially made a mistake here. How come I wrote CA0 there? Um, because I have this quantity up here that is equal to CA0. So you, you could leave it either way, right? You could write NA0 over V0, or you could just write it as um, CA0, their um, equivalent. So the theta i here, I'm, I'm trying to draw this as a, a capital as best I can, but it, it looks like a copyright symbol except with an H in the middle. So theta i is generally defined as NI0 over NA0, but since we're dealing with species A, uh, this is now NA0 divided by NA0. Since we're dealing with species A, um, and so this simply becomes one. Similarly, the stoichiometric coefficients here, this is minus one over minus one, which is just one, right? So for species A, that's not particularly problematic. For YA zero, remember YA zero will always be calculated as NA zero divided by NT zero. Again, looks like some kind of a weird O or something. That's always the case. It just so happens that for this problem, uh, it was pure A uh, as a feed. So we happen to know that um, NT zero is equal to NA zero. So this was from the problem spec. That's specific to this particular problem, right? If, if it was 50-50, then YA0 would be 0 0.5. Um, maybe we have to calculate it. Maybe we don't know what it is. Um, these two terms, the uh, T0 and the P0, these are both one uh, because it's an isobaric system, constant pressure, and we had assumed that it was isothermal. X sub A is okay, we don't need to solve for that. Nu sub A is equal to minus one. Um, and then the delta, remember delta is the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients. Nu sub I, uh, which in this case is two minus one, which is one. The nu sub A is minus one. So we've got all of the terms that we need there and now we just need to substitute them all in, which is, uh, it's it's actually not bad, right? The the end result here um, is not too bad. If we substitute all of those terms in, we get our R sub A is equal to minus K CA zero times one minus XA divided by one plus XA. Right? That's That actually simplified a fair amount. Um, not surprising because I, I set it up this way to, to simplify um, a fair amount. The reason it simplified so much is because the rate only depends on A, um, and the concentration of A usually simplifies quite a bit to things like one minus XA over something else. Um, if there were more than just the concentration of A in our rate law, that would not be pretty. Um, but it would still be doable, right? It would, we could always write it as just a function of, of X sub A, and that would be just fine. So if we now substitute that in and say V is Na0 Xa divided by minus Ra, uh, we will end up with N sub A0 X sub A. And then on the bottom, we'll have our rate, which is KCA0. The negative signs will cancel out. So it's already negative Ra, um, but Ra itself is already negative. So that cancels out. And then we're left with one minus Xa this should be divided by one plus XA, um, but I don't like the, what did John call them? Nested fractions. Hang on, it was over there in chat a minute ago. And it, whatever, John had a clever name for it and I already forgot it. I don't like writing nested, compound, thank you. I don't like writing compound fractions just because it gets really hard to see what's what. Um, so I'm just gonna move that one plus XA up to the top. We have a, a parameter here that showed up. It's, it's not actually necessary to make these identifications, um, but sometimes it can help because maybe you've already calculated that number. Um, and so it, you save yourself calculation somewhere. This parameter happens to be V0. Which is not a necessary substitution, right? We, just, we already know NA0, we could just calculate CA0. 
but we could just save ourselves this time since we already know V0. At coconut cookies coming back. All right, so uh, if we do that substitution, then we're left with V0 over K. Did I forget? No, no, I didn't forget. Uh, V0 over K times X sub A, one plus X sub A, divided by one minus X sub A. And so now it becomes another question of how do I want to solve that? If I eyeball that, it looks like I would be able to solve that with a quadratic equation um, because it, the denominator is all in terms of xa, so I can move that over. And then sooner or later, I'm going to get an xa times an xa. So it's probably going to be some function of like xa squared and xa and constants. Um, so probably a quadratic equation. Uh, I'm kind of rusty with the quadratic equation, although it is in your book. Um, but if you're rusty with MATLAB and don't feel like doing it in MATLAB, quadratic equation is your friend. Um, so you can always use that. From this expression, however you choose to solve it, put it in... Excel, put it in your calculator, put it in MATLAB, um, whatever you want to do, you will end up with exactly the same um, conversion that we had before, which should not be surprising, right? Because ultimately we started from the same place. The place that we started from was a material balance on A. We are still using a material balance on A to solve this problem. It's just that we have opted for this particular case to write the material balance on A in this particular form, right? And that was originally derived from the general material balance. So we had better end up in the same spot. If, if we don't, we've got a mistake in at least one place. So this is a, a good way to um, check your math, right? The, the problem is if you're prone to making the same mistake in two places, for example, you did this and forgot in both cases uh, to adjust K for temperature or something like that, it can give the misleading illusion that you have done it correctly because you get the same result in both cases. What it has really done is say, I know how to plug in the numbers in exactly the same way in the same places, which is a, a big step. Like that, that's nothing to, to laugh at, right? It's not often that we have sort of two separate ways to go about calculating the same thing. Um, so it, it can still be a very useful check. Um, but ultimately, this form cannot do anything that the general can't do. Um, but the general can do things that the, the specific, this, this XA version cannot do. Um, primarily, when you have multiple reactions, you should not use this expression because it won't work um, at all. There's a, a question over in chat. As long as the problem doesn't specifically say that pressure changes in a CSTR, can we assume it's isobaric? Yes. Um, the only time you will ever deal with a reactor that is not isobaric, there will be a specific piece of information provided to you to tell you how to calculate it. Um, usually it will be something along the lines of calculate the pressure drop. Um, but that, that will only come up in the next two reactors in the, the second half of the class. Um, Anytime you have a CSTR, you will never have pressure drop um, in a CSTR, and you will never have pressure drop in a fluidized bed reactor. Um, so those will always end up being exactly the same thing. Or sorry, it will always end up being isobaric. So we um, covered that pretty quick. quick. There was, oh, what was the one other comment that I wanted to make? I can't remember what it was. Oh, right. I wanted to bring up um, the stuff that we're going to see in the next few lectures. So we're actually going to end up mm, 10 minutes early here, something like that. I don't think anybody will complain about that. So the next topic covers the last homework problem. Uh, which will be, I'm just going to say that we're going to restrict this to three questions so that it's not um, overdoing it. Um, something that has come up before, uh, actually, it, it, how convenient, it just came up a minute ago. If we have an, uh, an expression like this, and I say, I can solve that with the quadratic equation. The quadratic equation will always give you two answers. Um, it's usually up to us to decide which of those two answers are relevant and which one is, is not. Um, it is, however, possible that both of the answers can be 
relevant. Um, and so the, the topic that actually John will end up introducing is multiple solutions. Actually have a physical meaning uh, in a CSTR. If all, th all of the solutions, both of them or three of them, or there could be five of them or something like that, there can be multiple solutions to these answers. Multiple solutions that are uh, physically meaningful. Uh, so multiple solutions um, can be physically meaningful. So it's kind of something that may have been uh, like nagging you in the back of your mind, right? We've been solving all these polynomials, um, a couple of the homework problems uh, from the previous homework and even from this homework are, are written as polynomials. Polynomials have multiple solutions. Most of the time we just discard them. But what could possibly happen if the other solutions were physically meaningful? Um, and so the, the topic that um, John is going to read, or not read, well, I assume he was going to read it too. The topic that he's going to cover on Friday's lecture are what we call multiple steady states. So it can be entirely possible that two reactors operated identically. So coming in, going out, coming in, going out with exactly the same, let's say that there's a utility on it, something like this, right? There's a little heat exchanger pushed onto it. If the inlets are the same, the volume is the same, the utility is the same on both of these. The reaction is the same, concentrations are, at least the inlets are all of the same, all of the utility flows and all of that stuff is the same. The outlet here might have, for example, a conversion of maybe 3%, and the outlet on this one might be something like 75% for exactly the same input uh, material, right? Exactly the same size reactor, exactly the same heat exchanger that's slapped onto it. For all of those conditions being the same, the reactor can operate in two completely different ways. The, the mathematical origin of that is that in these material balances, like this one up here, there can be more than one solution to that and it can be physically meaningful. The, operational impact of that, the, the, the physical implication of it, the real world implication, um, is that we have to be very careful how we make adjustments to a system if it can operate at these two multiple steady, at these two different steady states. There are ways that we can get it to always behave as though it's at the higher conversion or always behave as though it's at the lower conversion. Um, and yet there are these also very critical inflection points where if you're changing something, it can be sort of going along at like 3%, 3.5, 4%, and then it suddenly snaps up to 60 or 70% and the temperature goes through the roof. Um, or the reverse can happen, right? It can be very, very um, high conversion and maybe high temperature and you back it down and back it down and back it down until it gets to like maybe 75, 74, 68, 67, and then suddenly it drops all the way down to like 4% and the whole thing basically, well, it doesn't quite freeze solid, but the temperature might drop by 40 or 50 degrees. Um, those are very real phenomena. Um, we won't have time to get to all of that. Uh, so John is going to go through, which he's probably learning about this for the first time because I don't like I told him about it, um, go through how do we identify multiple steady states and classify them. The part that we won't have time to get to is how do we actually operate between the two. But that's covered in some detail in your book. Um, and so if, if you're curious about the the physical implications of that as well as where this actually happens in nature um, that is covered in your book. Um, but this is the, the topic that um, John is going to talk about on Friday is how do we identify when this is the case um, and how do we classify those, those different um, types of steady states. And then there'll be a homework problem for you to, to do exactly that type of classification. But this is like the, one of the neatest things that, that I think it beats even the other two reactors that we're going to see later. The other two reactors can't have multiple steady states. Only this reactor can have multiple steady states, at least under the models that we're working with. If you have more complicated models, yeah, you can have multiple steady states. Uh, but this is a really neat topic. Um, 
I, I, it's so cool that suddenly those other solutions are actually meaningful. Um, so we will get to that on Friday, but we're just going to call it here about 10 minutes ahead of time. I, I don't have another worked gas phase example that we could get through in any reasonable amount of time. Um, so I will hang out until the end of class, which is about 3.50. Um, you're more than welcome to ask me any questions that you have in, in chat. Don't forget the homework is due, I think, later tonight uh, at 11. And the tonight, yeah, should be tonight. Um, and then the project is due later in the week. So thanks, everybody. Stay safe out there. Um, I will also upload lecture 13. It's already on Canvas, but I, I recall now from the reminder in chat, I forgot to upload it to YouTube as well. So I will get that up to YouTube, and I will get this one up to um, YouTube as, as quickly as I can. The conversions in uh, Zoom have been a little bit slow lately, um, so sometimes it's not available until the next morning. So thanks, all. We will see you on Friday with John. Um, stay safe. Good luck. We'll turn on a little bit of, oh, good, still sharing. Let's turn on our duck music again, and then we'll answer some questions. There's our duck. All right, so a couple of questions. Oh, John wants to make a, oh yeah, yeah, go for it, John. Um, let me turn off the duck music. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, so just a real quick announcement, guys. Because um, I had a lot of uh, questions about the uh, homework too, um, it seemed like a, a lot of people are having various problems with a lot of the, like almost every problem actually. Um, so I'm gonna be opening up another um, sort of last minute office hours at 5.30 uh, until about 6.30 today. Um, so if you have any questions uh, that you need answered, feel free to stop by. Um, if there's multiple people coming in, which I suspect there might be, uh, I'm going to try to do uh, answers questions sort of um, uh, one by one as people come in. Uh, so, uh, you know, the sooner you get there, then the sooner you can get your question answered. Um, but yeah, feel free to stop by. It's going to be using the same uh, meeting ID that's on Canvas for my normal office hours on Tuesday and Thursday. How's it? Thanks, John. So let's see, a couple of questions. For the midterm project, it's supposed to be, how is it supposed to be formatted for one through seven? Um, you can use any of the, the standard formatting in like uh, Word or, or Google Sheets or, or something like that. So um, there's an option up at the top of Word to introduce um, like section headers and, and stuff like that. So I'll pull up a blank document here real quick. Um, so if, if this is your introduction, um, and this is text, and then you want to get down to, what was the next one? I think the next one was theory, something like that. Uh, Google Sheets has exactly the same functionality. It just looks different. You can click up here on header one, um, and it will just change the, the format for something like that. And then you can just add in all of your um, text or pictures or, or whatever it is that you want. But those, those headers are nice because it makes it really easy, for example, when you upload it to uh, Gradescope, it's really easy to find out where the different sections are. Um, but something like that is, is fine. You're welcome. Um, for problem 2.6, can we solve it by hand? I really doubt it. Um, I, I always hesitate to say, yes, you can solve it by hand or no, you cannot solve it by hand. Um, because, I mean, quite honestly, my algebra skills are not what they used to be um, when I was using algebra all the time, um, which you've probably noticed, right? I, I drop letters and negative signs in my work fairly routinely. Um, there are times, though, where I can say that you definitely cannot solve it, uh, because I'm pretty confident that there's no reasonable solution that can be obtained um, by algebra. But it's only reasonable, like, do I think that it's reasonable? Um, so you might be able to solve something like that by hand, but anytime that you see a, a reactor that involves both a material balance and an energy balance, boy, the odds of that being able to be solved by hand are, are kind of slim. Um, so I don't want to say that it's impossible, right? Two equations, two unknowns, you might be able to pull that one off. Um, 
I, I don't want to say that you can't, but I, I personally would not uh, because I'm not confident enough in my algebra uh, to solve something like that. If I would answer that differently, if we were doing midterm exams um, and I wanted you to practice that solution because you were going to be asked to do it on a midterm exam, you're not going to be asked to do it on a midterm exam. So it, it's more of a, a it's actually something nice about the setup of this course being all remote is I can focus more on the setup of the problem, which is sort of where the engineering is. And then we hit that wall of how do I do the math? Um, and I don't have to worry about you being in a situation where oh, I accidentally gave you too many homework problems that needed MATLAB um, and you weren't prepared to do that kind of algebra on an exam. It's not going to be any exam. So ultimately, if you get a system of equations, you can solve it any way that you want. Um, as long as it's great. But for problem 2.6, uh, it's non-isothermal and it's got a reaction in it. Personally, no, I would, I would not try to solve that by hand. Should we label them as midterm project one, two, etc. for the project? No, you don't have to put that in. Um, just make it look like a report with, you know, like introduction and theory and, and appendices and results and that kind of stuff. But you don't need the midterm projects one and two and stuff like that. The idea will be by the time you're done with this class, the thing that you're going to turn in is it's actually going to be a pretty impressive little piece of, of work that you're putting together. Um, you're, you're going to end up designing, and trying to solve a, a, a real world problem that is currently happening. Like as we speak right now, this is a problem. Um, so it, it'll be a pretty neat little project. How's Winston? Winston's good. He's snoozing right now. Let me see if he wants to come over. after turning it on. Uh, now there's a button on my microphone that um, I can mute it independently from Zoom. Uh, and so what you may be hearing or seeing is, is me reaching over and muting it. What made me name him after Winston Churchill? Yeah, he is named after Winston Churchill. Are you tired, bud? Yeah, you look really tired. Um, I, I didn't name him, my wife named him. Um, but it's an awesome name. Like he looks like a Winston Churchill. Look up, look up Winston Churchill. He looks just like this. Um, for problem 2.3, can we keep our NA0 in order to find a value of NA3 when we substitute it? I'm not sure what your NA3 is, but the NA0 that you calculate, um, the, the value of NA0 in problem 2 becomes the fresh feed in problem 3. Um, so the, the same number gets used twice there. But the feed to the reactor in problem three um, is not the same as the feed to the reactor in problem two. How old is Winston? Winston is two. Hi. Are you done sitting? You look really tough. Actually, you look pretty comfortable. He plopped his butt down, so I think he's doing okay. Hi. He's just staring at me, which is kind of cool. Hi. 
Very well. Winston's very sleepy in the afternoon, so he doesn't appreciate being woken up. Questions have, have died down, so I think I'm gonna wrap this up. Go ahead and stop the recording here. Still got the duck going, which is always good. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll see you on the next one.